Good evening and welcome to the third government plan virtual debate meeting here in the heart of St Helier. Tonight the topic of discussion is the island's economic recovery. How are we going to get out of the mess that Covid has made? Clearly I'm not Gary Burgess, my colleague and friend has taken a well-earned rest at home. Uh, we've insisted that he puts his feet up, but no doubt he is still tuning in and watching the proceedings here, keeping an eye on everything that's going on. Now, what is going on? We're here to discuss this, the government plan. This phone book, it contains the government's intentions for the next three years, from 2021 to 2024. And tonight we're going to drill down into some of the sections in this plan and see what our ministers are intending to do to help Jersey recover from COVID. Now then, a little bit of housekeeping before we introduce our ministers and watch a short video. First of all, the most important people here tonight are you at home, wherever you are watching this. We've also got a capacity audience of three, I'm pleased to say, who will also be able to ask questions as well. Uh, but what we really want to do is uh, list, get your questions and put them to the ministers. Um, more often than not, the only chance we all get as islanders to question our politicians is during election time. Well, this is not election time and this is a chance for you to directly put your questions to them. How do you do it? There's a couple of ways. First of all, if you're watching on Facebook, there might be a bit of a comment section down the side. You can post your question in there, but we've got people monitoring that who will feed the questions through to the computer in front of me. Best of all, though, is if you can go onto a website or app called Slido, S-L-I-D-O.com, Slido.com, and enter in, you can see the hashtag down there, GovPlan2021. Enter that in as the code, and you'll then be able to put in your questions. You don't need to download anything, you don't need to give any of your personal details, simply enter that code and ask your question. Or most of the questions will come up anonymously. If you want to put a name, that would be great. It helps identify that we're asking your question. Equally, you can get in touch by email, govplan2021 at gov.je. Fire your questions in that way. Or if you're old school, pick up the phone, double four zero eight hundred. You, we've got people manning the phone here. If, if that's the best way that you want to communicate with us, ring in your questions and we'll put them to the ministers as well. So before I introduce the panel, what I'd like to do is play you a little video from um, Senator Lyndon Farnham, the Deputy Chief Minister all about the economy. Responding to the economic and financial impact of COVID-19 will be a significant focus on our work and resources during 2021. And during the next three years, we will fund new economic growth initiatives to drive recovery. Recommendations will be made by the Economic Council and future measures will be agreed for implementation by the Council of Ministers. To make sure that we are targeting the investment in the areas which will have the most impact, each initiative will be supported by a robust business case and require the formal support of the Economic Recovery Political Oversight Group before final agreement by myself. In addition, we will continue to provide timely targeted and temporary financial stimulus to our economy throughout next year. These will continue the successes of the fiscal stimulus measures we implemented in 2020, including direct payments to income support and pension plus recipients, the £100 spend local cards, reducing social security contributions by 2% for nine months, and of course, the co-funded payroll support scheme, which continues to evolve. The State's Assembly has approved a fiscal stimulus fund to support the economy through the remainder of the year and into 2021. These economic support initiatives should quickly take effect to maximise consumer spending in Jersey, reduce falls in output and employment and reduce the structural impact on our economy. So that sets a bit of the scene for the topic of discussion tonight. And who have we got answering your questions? Well, sitting to my right, uh, we first of all have John Lafondre, the Chief Minister, uh, attending his third event in a row 
um, on these government plan debates. He's going to be with us all week. Uh, joining him is uh, Senator Lyndon Farnham, the Deputy Chief Minister and also the Economic Development Minister. Good evening. Um, further down the panel, we have the Minister for External Relations and former Chief Minister Ian Gorst, Senator Ian Gorst. And um, at the end of the table there, I'm waving to her, there is Deputy Judy Martin, who is the Minister for Social Security. So the normal routine these evenings has been that we'll go around the, the four ministers and they will each set out their aspirations their aims, their ambitions, their, their hopes for if this government plan is passed through the states, what difference that's going to make to all of us as islanders. Um, but we're here to talk about the economic recovery. And I think to help set the scene, what I'd like to do, if it's OK, Chief Minister, is start with yourself, Deputy Martin. Um, you're, all, all of you, all four of you have got a key role in how the island is going to fight its way out of this mess um, but you're responsible for the department where people are coming for help you've got people turning up to social security looking for extra help i know there's various schemes to help with wages but can you paint us a picture of how tough life is out there at the moment are people really struggling what is going on on you know at, at ground level so, uh, from March, we've obviously got approximately uh, at least over a thousand more people unemployed, and they're de you know, they're, they've had to come to income support where the co-funding uh, scheme uh, didn't help them. Um, but in the plan, we've got um, extra money about <laughs> for what we budgeted around seven million pounds to cover the uh, these people. We've also put in some more money for. Um, to help people retrain or back to work and uh, you know because the longer you're out of work the more you it's harder to get back in and we know people do the majority of people want to get back to work so yeah there's some good things in there and mm. I hope they get passed but I mean how difficult is it for people at the moment are they are they really struggling well, I, I always say that I think our benefit systems um, are a lot more generous than the UK, which is absolutely fine. But the people who lost their jobs will have extra bills. They, you know, thank God we've moved the tax because they would have had whatever they started last year's tax to pay on probably a better wage than they may have. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, people are struggling, but the you know they're, they're, each week I'm I'm informed by my officers that we. More people are returning to work, and some of the people who did have part-time jobs are now getting some hours back. So, yeah, it's um, not all doom and gloom, and, uh, you know, hopefully it, it carries on that way, that people are getting back into work. Right, so there's some green shoots already absolutely. kind of emerging. Yeah, That's absolutely. Good. Thank you for that, Deputy Martin. So, um, Chief Minister, how are, we, how are we, Jersey, going to recover from what COVID has done to us? I think you've got to look at short, medium and long term. <clears throat> and that's the point of the plan is that um, it, it, we've got two competing issues here. One is about the building on our priorities from last year, which is also dealing with um, a whole range of areas, uh, including underinvestment in, for example, a lot of our infrastructure, our IT systems, all the things that actually support the underlying services that we get to the public. Those problems haven't gone away. And that includes anything from getting new social workers in play to, um, as I said, to IT systems and modernization. We've then obviously got the impact of COVID and what's happened within the economy uh, during this year, and particularly with all the people to my right and the whole council ministers team. Um, we've put in so many measures to support lives and livelihoods, is the expression, um, which has uh, obviously had then a financial impact on the government finances. Um, so the short term has been getting people to where we are now in terms of supporting and from memory and the people, might, either Linda or, Ian or Judy can, can correct me, we've supported around, uh, I think it's at least 16,000 jobs through the co-funding payroll scheme um, to date. Uh, and, um, uh, and if you look, we're also supporting, for example, with a 2% cut in Social Security, which goes through to June of next year. That's every islander uh, up to the point of around £50,000 will, will feel, see the benefit of it. So there's a whole range of what I call short-term measures in play. What we then got is the medium-term recovery, which is, uh, so for example, we've got some fiscal stimulus. There's a £50 million pot that's been approved uh, literally uh, in last week, uh, which is about putting measures in place for next year. And then on top of that, We've got about a £40 million pot, which is sort of for long term or medium term, shall we say, perhaps a slightly longer term uh, economic recovery, and we'll be doing more about that. So there's some, there's some various measures that we've been putting through, 
back to the short term in terms of what else we've done, as well as the co-funding, uh, and as well as all the, uh, the income support and the CREST schemes that Judy's been looking after. Uh, we did the, which has been receiving small publicity recently, the um, spend local voucher that put about £10 million into the retail, well, into the economy generally, quite a lot at retailers, uh, within the six weeks up to the 31st of October. That's getting some intention now from, from the likes of Northern Ireland. Um, so so, all the, all these so we've done a load of measures to bring together. What you've then got to work out is how you pay for it. And that's that, also in the plan. That was going to be my next <coughs> question. All okay. these things are, are absolutely great, but they cost money. What, yep. how, how is that impacting government, your, your plans that you, you already had in place before COVID? How are we going to, you know, so how again, are we going to pay for it? Again, it goes in two ways. One is we've had the re projected reduction in income, um, which is uh, uh, significant, hundreds of millions of pounds, uh, depending whether it's over one, two or four years you want to look out at, but a uh, real hit into the, the revenue side. And then obviously with the money, the extra money we've been spending on COVID, uh, so you've got kind of two things which have basically put us into probably the biggest deficits we will ever see. Um, but what we've done, and as uh, Judy alluded to, uh, and a lot, we've all been behind this, is this switch, for example, to what we call the change in taxation base, the CYB, PYB uh, scenario to call it, which is putting everyone onto a currently based on taxation. That will have helped people this year uh, in terms of reducing their, their, the tax they would have had to pay about now. Um, but it also means that it generates, a, in cash flow terms, it generates a one-off lump sum of money in the order of about £340 million, um, maybe 320 340 over a period of time. And broadly speaking, with returns on that money, that should clear most, if not all, of the COVID-19 debt um, that we've generated to date. So um, we've dealt with this in a different way. Uh, because we've had very circumstances peculiar to Jersey, which have regularised a whole range of issues, which I don't need to go into right now. Um, but the point is, without actually putting tax rates up, so the profile, my profile of tax won't have changed. I will still pay the same, roughly the same amount of tax over my lifetime. I'll just be paying it slightly earlier. And that in itself will then help us avoid placing lots of debt or lots of tax rises, permanent tax rises, on future generations. But is so that, it is, is that, a plan to sort all this out. Is that is that that aim to shift people's tax rate from the you know the previous year to the current year, if that's going to be spread out over 20, 30 years, that some of the suggestions have been made, or you know, over a longer period, are we still going to be able to pay everything back, or we're going to have to loan and then pay, use that to pay back the loan? So the way it works um, uh, is that um, you've, you, the debt exists, okay, because that's basically what we've, uh, what we've either spent to date or projected to spend between this year and next year. So you've got to have a way you're going to repay it. And essentially what you do, because uh, once we've got some certainty around the exact detail of the 20 years and what that might look like in terms of uh, generating money, you can then essentially profile um, how you're going to repay the debt to match off the money as it comes in. So essentially it's a matching exercise. Uh, and yes, uh, on everything we're seeing at the moment, um, as of to date, it will pay, pay the debt off in a, in a reasonable period of time. Okay. We brought it, we have made that period longer. Uh, because it was felt actually it then took account of particular circumstances of individual, individuals to make sure it wasn't uh, a hit at the wrong time on, on people, which was basically listening to the public feedback that we took. Talking about hits on people, I mean, Senator Farnham, uh, arguably, um, whilst obviously the impact has been far-reaching, arguably you're responsible for a sector of the society that's been hardest hit with covid especially hospitality, mm -hmm. travel, tourism, the whole lot. How, how are you going to tackle those issues? How, how, are the, how are we ever going to get flights back to the island again, see hotels full, restaurants full, mm. those sort of things? It's, it's been a massive challenge for um, not just hospitality and, and hotels, but pretty much all, all of the ec economy. Um, some have fared better than, than others, and some haven't, of course, the prime objective of... of my department, um, working collaboratively, of course, with with other ministers, has been to uh, ensure we provide the financial support uh, to protect jobs and livelihoods and protect businesses, not least to help members of society, uh, of the community rather, mm. through this, but to make sure that we have, have our vital business assets still intact when, when the recovery um, begins. If we allow businesses to go now, then um, that's going to make the recovery uh, much more challenging. It seems biz some businesses are going, though. I mean, Th there's been a significant change, I think, to the, to the structure of the economy, especially in relation to 
um, commerce in insofar as we've seen significant changes in consumer behaviour. We've seen different demand issues for different types of goods. So we've seen some businesses just um, ha have really struggled because of the switch in, in, in buying patterns and the demand, demand for goods. <coughs> the retail um, sector is also particularly hard hit um, because as if the challenges weren't great enough for that sector come in, coming into the uh, pandemic, of course, it's now pushed even more people yeah. to um, out of necessity sometimes during lockdown periods to purchase online. But the retail sector has, I think, um, not notwithstanding the challenges, performed exceptionally well. And we've seen some really good examples of the sector embracing technology and really getting um, involved with, with um, more opportunities for online retailings. So I very much hope that islanders will um, subscribe to those um, new ideas and continue to support the local economy. I mean, in the in the government plan for um, the section that you're responsible for, it kind of almost starts off with you know we need to remain agile to build mm -hmm. capacity back. What does that What does that mean? Um, I think we have to be uh, put far more uh, focus on on innovation. Um, we've seen how uh, consumer behaviour has impacted on certain business sectors, and generally businesses have responded very well. They've changed their business model models. They've um, changed their structures. They've changed the the type of goods and services they've provided. Many businesses have said the, the measures that led them to reconsider the logistics of how they serve uh, people have actually driven out greater productivity in their business and are going to be main maintaining those. So the agility comes from being able to um, cut red tape as much as we possibly can moving forward to allow innovation, to allow more entrepreneurs, to allow new businesses um, to prosper post-COVID, um, uh, working very closely. And a big shout out to the team at Jersey Business who have been on the front line uh, uh, of this. So they are very well placed to be uh, uh, continuing to advise businesses um, as we move into the recovery period. Okay. And uh, Senator Gorst, um, you may have um, tuned in earlier in the week when uh, we had uh, Deputy Carolyn Labby speaking about um, Jersey's uh, identity and she perhaps raised concerns that we are maybe focusing too much on finance and a little bit overseas and what's happening to our identity as an island. Is now the time to continue investing in our overseas reputation, or do we do we look inwards and try and recover here first? We live in a, such a fast-moving world that we don't have the luxury of uh, choosing. We've got to do both, and it's uh, worth. Uh, I didn't hear those particular comments, but it's worth reminding ourselves that the one sector of the economy that has been resilient for all the reasons we would expect. Uh, during COVID-19 is financial services. Uh, they've continued to see uh, strong uh, client relationships, uh, strong deals being done, uh, people still wanting to use Jersey to structure their investments. They've been able to leverage off the technology investment that they've made, doing all the things that Senator Farnham's just been talking about. So uh, I think that financial services will continue to be the bedrock of our economy going forward. But does that mean that we shouldn't look for innovation and new income lines and diversification of our economy? No, it doesn't. We should be doing those things as well. And the issues that Carolyn's talking about around identity is, in some ways, going back to think about, well, what does it mean having a Norman heritage uh, in 2020? And how can we build that relationship with France and with Europe at a time when the United Kingdom is leaving the European Union? So these are challenges for us. There's investment in the government plan uh, to grow these relationships. We've created a new uh, uh, EU directive in my uh, section of external relations. And these are exactly what they're going to be trying to deliver. I mean, as if you haven't had a, uh, you know, your department has a, hasn't had a hard enough time as it is. You've now got Brexit looming as well. I mean, how how well are you are you prepared for that within the government plan to deal with that on top of everything else that's happened so far? Well, we're very prepared, and this is something that's been going on uh, for a number of years. The the irony of COVID is that it's. Uh, 
uh, put pressure on our supply lines, on our contingency plans, and uh, they've been able to be refined. They've been uh, shown themselves to be resilient, and these were exactly the areas that we would have been concerned about if there is no deal. Uh, at the beginning of next year. So I think we can be more confident. Retailers are telling me that they are more confident. There can still be disruption. We know that there's still going to be more bureaucracy whenever we have to cross uh, into Europe. That's going to be a fact of life going uh, forward. But I think we're well prepared for any eventuality. But it will bring change and it will bring challenge and it will bring uh, bureaucracy. But the people in my department who've been working on Brexit, um, whilst they're right in the heart of the negotiation, there are other people who've moved from Brexit and their everyday job is now looking uh, to the future uh, trading relationship with the rest of the world. And you think Jersey's got a, got a role in, the, in there? It's, it can be a, it can punch above its weight or it will be noticed? Or are we, are we a, a small incidental island that maybe is not going to have a voice when we're kind of cast out on our own? Uh, we, we already punch well above our weight in certain markets um, around the globe. I think the three of us here have made official visits to the United States, for example. You could think, well, that's such a massive, uh, powerful country. Why would we do that? But we see that even that relationship where there is the imbalance uh, can benefit job security to islanders uh, and, and help us um, develop markets for the future. You've got the Middle East the same. Uh, and there are other parts of the world as well. So we do punch above our weight, but we have to do it in a different way than you would do if you were a large sovereign state. You've got to try and come in there because, you know, we've, we, I mean, we've said this for a while, so anybody on the financial services side will know this, but maybe other viewers won't. Um, you know, we upstream about half a trillion of investment into the UK alone, which I think is, if I remember correctly, one pound in every 20, isn't it? So it's, it's of that ilk of direct foreign investment in the UK comes through us. Um, into Africa at something like one in 100 pounds, I think. And, um, and, so from a, and that's why, for example, um, we did op open up the, uh, the Jersey Finance Office in New York, which both Ian and myself and I think Lyndon have been to. Uh, I, went, I was there in January. And that, as I understand it, is, is already having an impact in terms of positioning us in a changing market when it's a flight to quality for business you know, we're there and we're talking to the right people and I believe that is generating returns. So again, that's about long-term positioning. And then you go back to the island identity side and go all the way back, which I won't go into too much detail, mm. many people should know, but like the Jersey Cow Project that's been running for decades now, I think, in Rwanda and places like that, you are having significant differences in a non-financial world on a, a, on a country in Africa. And that does two things. One is in, for a moral standing, being able to head up, hold your head up high, that's a fantastic story. Actually, it also gives you a different story to tell when you're dealing in other countries in that neighbourhood, for want of a better expression. And so there's, you know, um, Jersey is 9 and 9 by 5, uh, has always had a good story to tell. It's, uh, I think, the second biggest dairy herd in the world is the Jersey cow. And yes, most people in the world have heard of us, except they think we live in America and it's New Jersey. Yeah. And, but, you know, there are all those little levers that you can do to tell our story. And even hard-nosed financiers are interested in some of that history depending on where you're coming from. So yes, we can do it and we should continue to do it. And if, if there's all that, those trillions of pounds coming through Jersey, what difference does that make to the average islander on the street? It basically pays for, the chunk of it, if not all of it, pays for the services that we all enjoy uh, in a relatively benign way uh, in terms of the impact on the island and the environment and all those type of things. And it enables us as well to keep, therefore, general taxation down at a relatively moderate level uh, because actually it's the impact of, the, of that industry uh, that, that allows us to do the services we do. I think we've also got to remember as well, because we've talked about financial services, we always know on the tourism and agricultural side, we mustn't forget digital. And again, you know, we have a really good story to tell and it's another thing that actually in the places like the US and places like that are interested to hear because we've got the third fastest broadband in the world. Hmm. In, in a nutshell, it creates jobs and it creates opportunities for uh, islanders that other sectors don't necessarily uh, create, uh, and it creates uh, tax take, uh, and of course all of the other uh, social investment that financial services firms make here in, in Jersey. 
So talking about tax take and individuals' earnings and things, Deputy Martin, I know we spoke briefly at the beginning there, but again, in the government plan, you set out your intentions to support islanders in whatever way is possible, whether it be through income or, or assistance or benefits. I mean, how, how do you see that going forward? Um, one of the proposals in here to um, help pay for the impact of COVID is to, in effect, raise, raise the um, Social Security Fund, freeze the payments into it. Does that leave you in a precarious position if we're going to be paying more to help people? Well, we're taking one year at a time and we're doing an urgent review because I want to leave the Social Security Fund and the Health Insurance Fund in as good as it is when I leave mm -hmm. because I think it was, I'm going to go back to um, Senator Lassoir and I don't even remember if he was a committee president at the time or even a minister, I think it was, and he started slowly putting up contributions that people would so we are we've got s six years at the moment it may be five at the end but it, it's not going to go and that's if we don't collect another penny mm. in the social security reserve fund for our pensions and other benefits and then i say the other one is the hif which i'm transferring some money to ke kick start the health health care uh, model yep. um which i'm fully behind i think if we do it right it'll be brilliant um but it's going to take money and uh, this is uh, you know, there's we're basically borrowing from ourselves, but I need to know it's um, going to be sustainable. And do you need do you need state assembly approval to take money from the HIF fund? Oh, oh yes, yes. Yeah. It's um, I've got two separate propositions in for both of the uh, the social security fund and the health insurance fund. They come straight after the government plan. Obviously, it'll be approved if it's approved in the government plan. Yeah. I present them, and then obviously they will, will be passed. But yeah, absolutely, it's in law. It has Indeed. to be um, state assembly. I'm sure people will be uh, reassured to hear that. I mean, and, and, and something else that might be reassured is, is your intention to review the way the minimum wage is agreed. What are your, what are your thoughts there? Yes, because every year we go out, um, it's, since it, was in, um, it came in in 2005, we go through the um, employment uh, and, and go out to consultation. And this year, we, I, because of COVID, I knew people weren't up for that, so I asked them not to go out to consult. Again, we had a backbencher bring a... a, a a different minimum wage and I think a lot of states members were quite surprised that like, even if we went there I had to go out to consult because it's in the law so it's more that and then you know we do need to have a political discussion do we keep going out do we start then you know do we start setting the wage um, so it's all different things but that's the review we're going to do um, on the minimum wage and, yeah. and do you have a, a, a target or a figure in mind where that needs to be or is it just the general approach to it you want to look at Firstly, the general approach, yeah. and then what the economy can uh, take, obviously. Um, yeah, absolutely. OK, right. Well, just to um, thank you for that, Ministers, just to remind everybody who is tuning in from wherever you are, you can get in touch um, and ask your questions via Slido. Um, just Google it, slido.com, Slido. You don't need to log on no personal details, and simply enter the hashtag GovPlan2021. You can see at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen there, and then you'll be able to um, ask any question you like. Now then, I think what we should do is take a, a question from a member of the audience. Our capacity crowd here is uh, itching to get going, so if I can invite Ryan to come up to the microphone and pose your question, please. And who's it to? Good evening, Ministers. This will be to uh, Chief Minister or Deputy Chief Minister. Um, my name's Ryan. I'm the Chairman of the uh, Performing Arts Development Group, so I'm representing uh, the arts industry in the island. Coronavirus has impacted all sectors in Jersey, with the arts and the events sector being heavily hit. It's disappointing that within the plan, there's no mention of the arts um, within the government plan. So, Chief Minister, you talked about short medium and long term and chief deputy chief minister you mentioned about innovation can you tell me what short medium and long term plans there are to financially support the local arts industry including our theatres what minister will be responsible for leading this going forward i'll do the high level and i hand over to lyndon uh, short answer is there is money in the government plan which is new money for the um, uh, arts uh, world arts and heritage uh, and that does go up and it's carrying out the uh, um, decision of the states to do the one percent um, of uh, the one percent extra funding uh, for the arts, and we've stuck with that. Um, um, we were always going to, but the, uh, the the discussion we had earlier this year was about the profiling. 
So originally we were going to give slightly more money next year. Uh, increase is going forward, but it wouldn't have quite got to the 1% on the timetable that was envisaged, but it would still have been an increase in money relative each year. Um, uh, in the end, uh, particularly with some uh, pushback from uh, one or two members, we've said, fine, we've met the commitment in 2022 to hit the 1%. It just means you don't get quite the same amount of money that we were anticipating next year, if that makes sense. But we get to the profile that the state's decided on. Um, uh, so the point is there is money in there, uh, and um, uh, as I said, provide subject to the approval from the Assembly. Um, there's also obviously other aspects that cover heritage and, and other areas. Lyndon, you want to? Yeah, I think, I think, Ryan, following up from what, what John has said, is probably in the government plan in, in terms of context and percentage, the, the arts are receiving the greatest increase. Um, on the back of a proposition by Deputy Tadier, who was the former assistant minister with responsibility for the arts and culture, we're going to give 1% um, uh, of, um, of, of our spend, basically, um, which increase, what that means is for the term of this government plan, if it's improved, that will put another £10 million on top of the current budget for arts, culture and heritage. On top of that, we've got two new strategies, <clears throat> one for arts and one for heritage, which are uh, which are under uh, way right, right now. In, in addition to that, I know the Opera House is likely to be, and possibly um, Elizabeth Castle, I know we're straying into the heritage uh, grounds now, um, and, and other aspects of um, the sectors uh, could be beneficiaries of the fiscal stimulus funding that was agreed by the states a week or so ago. So is there significant um, additional support for those sectors, I'm pleased to say. Okay, right. Do you, are you happy with that response? Do you have anything you want to come back with? Yeah, I, I, I guess um, who will, who's going to be their cultural development officer going forward and who's going to be leading this? So, um, obviously, the, um, the, the, is no, the, no longer the, here. The, the buck will stop with me as the minister responsible. I'm hoping to pass delegation to a new assistant minister, and that's due to be announced, I think, by the end of this week, okay. beginning of next week. And um, part of our restru in, internal restructuring will mean there's there's far greater resource, officer resource, for the sector. Okay. So it's all it's all coming together well. And like I say, I want to reiterate um, a significant uplift in funding for Thank the sectors. You. Thanks. All right, thanks, Ryan. Something maybe all of you can have a go at here. Um, just briefly, somebody anonymous has uh, emailed in their question on Slido. Obviously, the government plan looks forward to 2021 up to 2024. But what are your visions? How's Jersey going to look in 2040? What kind of island are we going to live in? I'll give you the long-term vision, but I think it's... Um always very difficult to predict where we're going to be in 20 years time when you're in the middle of a pandemic but it is you know what do you want to see well, it's also always going to be around hopefully what's going to be good for us when either when we're in our retirement depending on our age or our grandchildren or our children and what they're going to be seeing and for me that's going to be around um you know better or good and better education service than what we presently have same in terms of health services uh, but you need a decent economy to pay for that and obviously that's living in a in a better uh, or as, as good as, if not better, environment than what we presently enjoy. We've always got to remember that, actually, uh, even though we're very self-critical at times, um, Jersey is still a fantastic place to live. The environment generally is pretty good. Uh, we can always do better. We know that. Um, but actually, in terms of the economy, again, we've got to see and grasp the opportunities and how the world is going to change over the next probably five years, let alone the next 10, 15, 20 years. But I think um, the point around that is, is putting the foundations in place, which always goes back to people, hence the education and the skills side, and then building on that. Obviously, what our plan is about is sorting out, uh, well, basically setting some of those foundations that you can then build on. And that's about getting the investment in the right places and then getting it implemented. And Senator Gorst, uh, just to jump over to you there. I mean, what, what, what's, what's our finance sector going to look like? Are we going to be completely dominated with office blocks full of finance workers in 20 years time uh no we're not and i i would uh, agree with what the chief minister said we in 2040 uh if we get it right will continue to be an island of opportunity which is a great place uh for islanders to live and work uh but we need to come together uh in order to do that i absolutely believe that in 2040 uh financial 
business, the service sector will continue to be playing a really strong part in our economy, offering opportunity and jobs to islanders as it does today. Because of what's happening with technology, we will not need to continue to build offices in the way that, uh, that we have. I know that was controversial perhaps some, uh, at the time, but we see that uh, gravity moving. We see uh, firms that even as they increase their employment numbers are reducing the space that they need. That's going to allow us to deal with some of the housing shortage crisis that we've uh, got. So I think we stand on the cusp uh, post-COVID of a really exciting uh, opportunity around uh, great education opportunities for our children, great uh, job opportunities using technology but also being connected to the uh, rest of the world and equally being able to showcase ourselves as a green environmental island if we get right the development issue, if we get right the coastal national park, if we get right the marine uh, park as well. So I think we, we stand on the edge of really exciting opportunities. Um, Senator um, Deputy Martin, for you, for 20 years' time, presumably proportionately more pensioners, more drain on the Social Security Fund. Absolutely, and that's square in that circle, isn't it? Because mm. people want ni nil net migration, and I, I need my pension paying for, because I've been paying for everybody's pension in the last 60 years since we introduced it. Everyone seems to think there's a little pot down at my office with their name on it, actually... The minute we started collecting, I think it was six months or a year later, we started paying out. Mm. Absolutely right. That's how you got buy-in. Um, technology, and look what's happened since COVID. I mean, we can literally do a virtual state sitting. With, uh, legally, we have to be in the island, but we, we could be any... Uh, we're in the world and and again that will help with uh, recruitment and people don't have to be here um and i you know the, the way that we've uh technology has moved and i think um or um he's my assistant minister but it's also deputy chief uh, minister uh, deputy wickenden um you know the money we do need to get it right what we um invest in technology and digital now is set in the scene we know we've done well um so far but we need to invest because we can't be left behind and um, it, it, I can't even imagine the world in 20 years if you just think what's happened in the last 10 and it's all going that way, you know, so it's amazing. I mean, and, I and hope I'm here to see it. Yeah, I mean, the, the, <laughs> the investment in technology is undoubtedly going to change things. What about investment in people? What about oh, helping yeah. upskilling local people, giving them the yeah. jobs? I, I hate that word, upskilling. I call it cross-skilling. Okay. Because, as I say, the people I found, you know, people have lost jobs, the jobs might not be there. They don't know what they're good at until we we can um, help retrain or think about different jobs. And I forgot to say, we've got a, a fund um, which mo employers can get up to £8,000 um, for the employee they take on. So we're basically we're funding their first X amount of weeks or, or, or months wages to give them a start and, and see if that's, their, you know, that's what their new uh, job will be. So, yeah, absolutely. You've got to invest in people. And I don't, you know, it's never going to be all working from home because I, I speak... I, it, it, Oh, yeah. having a five-day state sitting from my living room on my own was not fun. <laughs> so, I, you know, the in and out bit is great, you know. Mm. Um, there's certain things, but not all the time on your own. You, you, you get a, you know, you like to speak to your colleagues and everything like that. And yeah. um, most people, but, but there'll be a balance and yeah. that's what it'll be. Okay, Senator Farnham, what does Jersey look like in 20 years to you? I think it's going to be really essential we find um, a, a strong partnership between our environmental aspirations and our economic um, and the economic reality. Productivity is something um, we're focusing on more now. Simply put, that means we have to produce more economic output with less uh, resources. Of course, that's driven by immigration and our migration policy. As more people have been um, coming in, we've been having to find uh, more housing. So if we can get the productivity right, and of course cross-skilling, as Judy calls it, is absolutely critical to that as we embrace new technologies, artificial intelligence and so forth. Um, and, I don't, and I don't believe we're going to have a problem with that because the work that we're doing now with the education system and preparing for that, and, and I think we've got really, really strong cohort of, 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 of young people. Our, our, our results tend to be you know, way yeah. above the national average, so we've definitely got the, the, the ability here and we've got to embrace it and help our young people be properly skilled for the um, opportunities the, the economy um, throws at them economic framework and future economy works dealing with 
that now. Of course, the Economic Council will be publishing their report at the beginning of December, which goes into the long term, which is some exciting... I mean, it has some hard truths about what we need to improve on, but I think that it shows some, some um, exciting prospects. And also, just going back... Um, to the environment, and especially the rural economy. We've, we've made some great strides in, uh, strides in the rural economy in terms of looking at new and, and more um, higher value um, products, but of course we must embrace that because our farmers are the stewards of our countryside, and that's hugely important in maintaining the natural beauty of Jersey. You mentioned in there um, young people mm -hmm. investing in those. There's been this, there has been a problem of, of you know, our very, our top students going off to university and many of them never coming back how do we how do we attract them to come back to jersey to say this is the place where you can thrive you can make a living you can you know set up a family home we we well, well first of all it's we've got to afford address to buy a house the, the affordability yeah. of, of housing and that's one of there's um it's one of the things that keeps me awake at night is is that very issue and how and how we deal with it. it's not just about supply uh, and demand, although um, that, that's a, a very big part of it. So I think key to that is finding a solution for affordable housing and different schemes to get young people into, into housing. Um, and we can look around the world and see some fantastic examples of where this has been uh, successful, but we failed to have the vision. And I'm not blaming in previous committees or previous ministers collectively. I think we failed to embrace the vision we need uh, uh, to do that but that is for me the number one uh, priority to, uh, a lot of our young people go off to university some come back fairly quickly some never come back but qu quite a few come back 15 20 years later when they've seen some of the world they've settled into a career they've reached a level and there are opportunities for them to come uh, come back of course the cross skilling we talked about earlier and the new opportunities in perhaps in, you know Ian, Ian talked about what financial services might look like but if we get the the education program right and the co cross skilling and the on on island opportunities for young people right that could lead to many of them making the choice to stay here and, and go into the new to our new advanced digital te technology driven economy that we're creating i mean just just briefly going back there to the to the affordable housing it seems that it you know um it's often a, a phrase used you know we're going to investigate we're going to we're going to try and provide more affordable housing it seems like the parishes are the ones setting the setting the example building the whether it's the co-funded schemes or the help with the deposits or whatever it might be we've just seen a um, an estate opened in St Martin, named after the former constable there. Mm. You know, mm. there are lots of little yeah. niche parish schemes that do really help. Is that not yeah. something that the, the states not. could do generally? On a much wide? bigger scale. Mm. We've, we've tried it. We've, we've seen successes Trinity, St Martin and other parishes, but we just need to be brave enough to... Um, to grow that on a, on a scale that's going to make a, a, a real difference. We've seen some, some interesting ideas um, with the waterfront development and the apartments down there that are quite appealing to some young people. And the, the build of the horizon um, has enabled young people during the build to sign up and pay their deposit during the build period. So that's a three-year period to pay their deposit. So the time, by the time their property's finished, the deposit's paid, the mortgage is, is agreed, and they're in. Because the big problem is not so much... Um, being able to finance a loan, but finding deposits and that initial big chunk of money you need to get on the property ladder. But of course, it also has to be underpinned by a, a, a very strong um, offering of, uh, of good housing. Not everybody wants to buy. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, Andium have some exciting plans there, and I think they're well placed to take advantage of those opportunities. Senator Gorsa, do you want to add anything there? No, I, I didn't know whether it was Judy, but Andium are doing lots of those exciting things right hmm. now. I have on their first time list. Um, from memory, um, the last time a question was asked, it's around a thousand people on the waiting list, and they're all been vetted and they can all afford a mortgage so this is you know it's, mm. it's about the supply and demand and and are doing a brilliant job at the same time they're refurbishing all the older estates and rebuilding but you know living in the middle of two really big andean projects and they're now nearly one's finished and one's nearly finished and the the first one is half for sale so you know people are in there and it's great 
but that's always going to be when you've gone to uni you meet a partner in a different part of the of the uk possibly the uk probably the uk and your house prices are a third of what they are here yeah. and it's a big ask but um lyndon is right there was a survey a few years back and it's around about 10 years and a lot of people who come back bring another graduate with them and that's great for jersey mm. but it is they've got to come back and make sure they maintain their at least a standard of living they've got um uh, in the UK and, and I mean, it's, it's, our, our house prices here I mean they're, they're, they're a big talk about at the moment and I know they, they came up last night as well but I mean how much are they being driven by investors overseas investors snapping up share transfer properties you know they're, they're good investments to make is you make far more than your money sitting in the bank if you can afford to buy one well we've talked about that actually a number of times amongst ourselves and, and to be frank uh, part of the delay of not doing this has been because of COVID if we'd had a, a normal year I think we'd have been a lot less, a lot, a lot further progressed in this particular area. But I know, uh, certainly most of us, I think, around the, the table, vast majority of around the um, what we call the external buy to let side. Mm -hmm. Frankly, uh, I think most of us think that needs to be addressed. Uh, certainly for me, it was an election commitment, and um, we need to be yeah. dealing with it. What we actually said mm -hmm. last night or the night before, I can't remember, is um, the first bit that's coming through, which is not directly to do with housing. Uh, is what we called enveloped properties, which was about uh, a, a effectively a legal loophole in the stamp duty side for commercial properties. Now that um, I raised, uh, I think, at the end of 2018, and I believe the legislation is is now either ready to go or nearly ready to go. It's taken that long to get to get it there. <coughs> so it gives you an idea of sometimes how long it takes to get from wanting something in place to actually being able to implement it. And this will be, I think, another area that we want to get addressed because. It does not make sense whether you, whether you, when you've got a constrained issue of can you actually have people from outside buying internally. And ordinarily, there's no particular reason. If you haven't got these issues, it's great because of investment and all that type of thing. But then you get into the territory of, and it is anecdotal, but the point is if you can, if it's possible, then let's close it before it comes a problem, if you see what yeah. I mean. Uh, is, um, do they actually actually rent them out at all? for uh, full-time occupation in that territory. And there's, there's differing comments around that. But at the end of the day, let's close that particular loophole and now we'll get it done. Uh, but the point is, sometimes to actually get the legislation to do that can take a while because there's all sorts of anomalies in there and how do you make sure you cover it? But there, so is, a, there I, I is a government be will it. and an ambition to try and close it. actually agreed it in, in, in principle. Right. Um, and um, the vast majority of... Of, of buy to let owners are, are, are local investors. Yeah. We're absolutely right. clear. It's a very, very small percentage that are overseas. The majority okay. is, is, is local. That's a that's a different, uh, perhaps a different uh, challenge. So, mm -hmm. you, so that means that you can you can kind of drill down into the share transfer market and see who's buying what. Because I thought it was quite difficult. Well, I think that's the query. You see, that's where we're talking about: is it in the margins uh, or not? Um, so, th that's the point about if it's um, if it can be done. Uh, i.e., is, is it potential for more people to do uh, to, uh, to buy in uh, buy in from external to the island? Then it's almost certainly not something unless there's very particular circumstances you don't want to be encouraging. So let's close it before it becomes a problem. So the issue around how many units are involved, I don't know the answer to that for exactly the reason mm. I was alluding to, which is around um, having the data and things like that. Now, having said all that. From memory, uh, we've had actually a proposition in the States which did actually talk about um, getting that data together, and that is something, therefore, a piece of work that will be done. Again, a lot of this stuff is actually uh, how you actually do it, because although it may sound odd, particularly in a small island, is actually having the legal virus to get that data when potentially it's shared between different organisations. Mm. And that's one of the issues we've got to do it. But I think from memory, uh, we're meant to have those systems in place um, I believe the target has been by, I'm going to look down the line, end of next year, but um, uh, i.e. we do have to do something about it. All this is, of course, predicated on the fact we do come out of the pandemic of at some point and we can actually get back to business as usual. Because I'm sure there's nothing um, as, as depressing for a young couple trying to save up a deposit to get onto mm -hmm. the property market and see new builds developments in Jersey advertised overseas or advertised with fun, you know with funds can come in and buy them and just to be clear we, we have made it clear to the um, the organizations that we do have influence over that we do not support that mm. and that that should not be happening any yes. if, if it was anymore I think the other point just to part of this is, is all around medium-term thinking as well because you've got to get as we're enjoying the fruits of 
decisions that were made over the last few years about uh, that pipeline of developments that are coming through that Andium, for example, are doing. What we've now got to be doing is, um, uh, which I've alluded to yesterday, so I won't go into too much, is like the office of state strategy, the, uh, sorry, the office strategy and the state strategy, which are land and buildings that the states itself owns on behalf of the public, is how we can free those up for brownfield development. Now, if we can get that in play, and that hopefully starts being implemented during the course of the next few months, then actually, in a couple of years' time, once you can actually move people around into the right place, then that starts freeing up a number of brownfield sites. So then that's again about getting future supply, which by that point, hopefully, you've then got your policies in the right place to then get okay. into that sort of virtuous circle. So there's hope there. Yeah. Right, just before inviting a, another member of our um, audience to ask a question, there's one that's popped up there a couple of times I can see online. Is it true that high net worth individuals have been given a tax holiday? Any truth in that? No, not that I'm aware of. Not. I think it's highly unlikely, and um, <coughs> um, so the short answer, no, definitely not. OK, I'm sure they'll be pleased to hear that. Right, now then, uh, John, you were here yesterday, so let's, let's uh, invite you back up um, with tonight's question. OK, so I'm John Baker, I'm chairman of the Jersey Action Group, and I want to talk about economic recovery, and I want to talk about a couple of things that will help us dramatically with the recovery that you are working on. Uh, the theme is really uh, kicking cans down the road, and we're talking the big picture, the big stuff, and it's about the projects that you and previous governments have never grasped the nettle on that make the big picture different if we can solve them. The hospital is something, you know, 10 years in, in talking about it, five years looking for a site, £50 million. Pound. Finally, you've stopped the can. You're starting to, to talk about the future. Well, it's on the horizon. That will be great. Once we start building that hospital, that will help the economic recovery. John spoke briefly about Fort Regent. That's, that's another can that's been kicked down the road for uh, too many years. I don't, even I've lost count. 20 years, 10, 10 certainly. It's taken five years, or probably eight, to, to knock the old swimming pool down. And th 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 that was just a joke in itself. So John spoke briefly last night about lifts at Snow Hill. I'd like to hear about the big plan, the whole thing. If you haven't got any ideas, come to me. I've got loads of ideas. How about an Eden project up there? I'm in touch with the people at Eden. It's an easy thing to do. Our, our climate's wonderful. Uh, the other things that you need to, to, just reminding everybody, and the population policy. It's because you haven't got a population policy, I would remind you that you've got a housing crisis and that we have to, we're told we have to build 4,000 new residential units because the island plan 2011 allowed for 300 people per annum which would, do the maths, 10 times, th that would be 3,000. So you probably would only need 1,000 houses. But you're telling us we need now 4,000. Over the next year, we need 8,000. When and, and how you put that population policy in, in place, hopefully, will help us slow down that, that housing crisis. Well, John, let's just pause you there, because yeah. that, that fits in with a, a question that's also been asked here as well, which is the, the building of flats is being used as Jersey's answer to economic recovery. Uh, seems a bit of a lazy and lame excuse. Where are the big infrastructure projects? Oh, I was going to say the hospital is probably quite a big infrastructure <laughs> project. Um, and the fort. I think the... Uh, right. Uh, I mean, this is also about, the, as you say, about trying to grasp the, net, the nettle on certain things. And um, I will actually... You're not going to like... You may not like this one because you might think, oh, it's just money. But actually, the PYB, CYB thing, OK? Uh, I can say this now. Sure. If you go back to a corporate services scrutiny report of 2004, somewhere between 2014 and 2018, because that was when I was on it, I'm just going to actually, made, actually made a recommendation about moving to a current year basis. And we've done it. It was approved in the States four weeks ago. Yeah. Um, so, if you see what I mean, uh, and it's been bounced around for quite a long time. Sure, now, that's a small measure. I'll talk about tax in a minute. Uh, well, it's 330 odd million quid. Yeah, but yeah, there you yeah, go. Yeah. And, and I must admit, when, when I first came across it, and it was actually raised, raised in, a, in a Treasury hearing, I think, at the time, I must admit, my vis vision for that, if you like, was that could have helped deal with part, part payment for the hospital. Obviously, I didn't envisage a COVID pandemic, and obviously, we haven't used the money for some, something else. But anyway, um, population. One of the issues we came through, um, uh, again, through the work that we set going around, uh, which was originally led by Chris Taylor, and then, and then Roland and others have taken it over, um, on the what are called the Population Development Board, uh, Policy Development Board, which is about a group of people going and having a good dig into the data. And the problem in the past sometimes is that you haven't actually had the resource to go away and do the research. People have been doing it on what they call the side of their desk. So they're dealing with 10 other things, and suddenly they realise they've got to get it done. And, well, well, we'll put it again in a, well, not quite a week, but, you know, it's, it's not always as thoroughly researched as you'd like. 
And the issue there is that, um, and I've not been critical here, it's just the nature of the system. And sometimes you're being hit by so many things at differing times. And don't forget, uh, 2008 to 2011, we had the financial crisis type of thing and the ongoing impacts of it, which has rolled on for quite a long time, uh, and then recovery from that. Um, is that the, uh, you're right, the, the policy, if you like, of 325 was there for a long time. But the controls weren't in place that allowed us that even if you stopped issuing licenses, um, sorry, under the present system, even today, if we stopped issuing licenses tomorrow, I'm just using, trying to keep it simple, the population will still continue to grow. Because the way the system works, and we call it automatic gradation, there's a slightly more informal subject, uh, label used to, in, internally. Um, people still keep progressing through that naught to five years. And as soon as they come into year six, they move along, and another bunch of people come in at year zero, and they just keep moving along. And what we've been proposing, that's why, yeah, I'd love to have come back with a population policy saying we're going to only have X number of people in a year. It would, from my point of view, it would have been a completely meaningless number because um, uh, you didn't have the controls to actually stop that automatic gradation. And that's what we've lodged, uh, was, was going to be debated for next Tuesday. Um, Scrutiny have actually asked us to defer it, so it's actually been communicated to members tonight. Uh, I've said I don't mind a small delay. So I've said 9th of February, I think it is. It's the first sitting in February we're going to go for, but it is a further delay. Uh, and I would make the point that what we've lodged is not significantly different to what we'd actually published in March of this year. So, um, so we're trying to deal with that elephant in the room, and, yeah, we've got to, because, frankly, um, I, don't, I don't know if any of us have worked out whether we're standing again in, 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 you know, in, in May of 2022, but if we haven't done something about it, we will be severely criticised, because it was one of the things we stood on the... Uh, uh, on the on the podium for when we stood, um, hospital we've talked about as I said, uh, you know for all sorts of reasons um, it went through and don't forget it got rejected twice uh, the the old schemes on uh, on the same site. Yeah. So why my view was why would one go back to that same site again? Uh, without having something significantly different. So a whole piece of work went through, and yes, some of us expressed different views of where it should be, but actually. As far as I'm concerned, I went nowhere near site selection. None of us did. In fact, we had reservations around uh, those, those last five, I think, because we're thinking, you know, we've got a political decision on People's Park here, but we were absolutely clear we had to stick with the process. Anyway, we've got to that point. So we've got a, um, a developer, a contractor in place, step one. We've got a site in place, step two. We've got to get the funding in place. That's going to be uh, summer next year, hopefully. That's step three. That's the crucial point. And then the final crucial one is the planning permission. And the aim is to be contractually committed before the next elections. And if we can get there, timetable's tight, but it is doable, um, then actually we've achieved it. And that, I'm afraid, we can only judge when we get to May uh, 2022. And finally, Fort Regent. Um, again, uh, there are pieces of the work, and, and Lyndon's, well, everybody's been huge, hugely involved around that side. And what I said, uh, I think, yesterday, for me, there was a short and a medium term, because there's, there's the risk. We talk about it every time. We get sidetracked. You then get to the end of next year, and you think, well, we haven't done anything in Fort Regent again. And so the two pieces of work were, A, this sort of medium term vision, which um, I didn't want to comment too much on. Funny enough, you know, it's got fabulous gardens and things like that, that or did have. And one of the pieces of work we'd like to see is a restoration of that, for example. May not be an Eden project. So no, no, but Helligan Gardens. You've got to bear in mind yeah. money here is important. But the other bit, finally, was the short-term thing for me, which I was very, very clear on, and I'm hoping to see revised plans uh, again before Christmas. We've seen some, um, which was actually about getting the entrance to Snow Hill sorted out. That's something we've been asking for for 30 years. If we can tick that, then we've actually done something. Uh, and I said I'm hoping to see plans for that. Uh, before Christmas. Okay, and then we'll if we get those, then that would be a planning application next yeah. year. And if we can be contractually committed to that before the elections, again, it'll be happening. The, so it's certainly the, the Fort Region access would, would be a kickstart of that. If yeah. I can finish my list, because these are all very important things. Um, electoral reform. I live in St Helier. My constable represents 36,000 people. The constable in St Mary represents 3,000. Enough said. When are we going to get that done? Um, failing states IT systems. What, how much have we wasted? 10 million, something like that? That needs sorting. Um, neglected states' properties. I mean, my God, you know, this has been going on and on. The hospital is a good example. Touching on that, obviously, we, we mentioned the heritage properties. The, um, the Opera House, uh, the roofs has been leaking as, as long as I've known the place. Elizabeth Castle is falling down. All of these states' properties. Piraya House, in this, in, you, you come out the states' building, and there's a building in front of you that needs a million pounds spending on it. Why did you not spend some money on it? So that needs addressing. 
our tax system, John, you know our tax system is 100 years old. Just about, we're just about to hit the century with that one. It was something from the 20s. And yet we've still got, and you called it mildly regressive, but I'll call it regressive. GST is a regressive <laughs> tax. You tax people and they pay tax on their food, which, by the way, they don't do in the UK. And then they have to go to duty because they're, t they're, they're rent stressed. I mean, that's so wasteful because you need more civil servants to run the show. So I remember two years ago, Alan McLean being questioned by Sarah in the States saying, when are we going to review our tax? Oh, we're working on it. We just keep hearing that. Another can kicking exercise. Okay, very John, quickly, well, look, let's, let's very let's quickly, just... government and uh, government silos. We saw an example of that still working last night. Farm chemicals causing sea lettuce. We We've known about that for five years. I've been harping on about that. I could go on. So right. can kicking, the big projects, well, stop kicking the cans. So John, John started his election campaign early for 2022 with that speech. But just, just, uh, just developing that initial question further yep. um, to the social, um, to um, Senator Farnham, can you just uh, give us a very brief explanation to to those watching how you know when we're talking about these some of these huge infrastructure projects such as such as the hospital and other mm -hmm. things there are eye-watering sums of money involved mm -hmm. how, how does that help the economy how does that kick start the economy oh well, there's many many ways a new hospital will will help the uh, economy uh, of course not not least there's um um the, the construction work and and also the, the huge amount of um opportunity that um, is going to be there for young people wanting to come into construction. We're just about to start a social engagement um, program that will include young people, include schools, and, and offer sort of all sorts of apprenticeship opportunities right throughout the construction um, centre because we want to achieve as much as that project, that build, uh, and planning uh, as, as possible from on island skills than rather than, than importing it. Of course, hospital, then there's all sorts of medical technology. Um, that's that's becoming um, that's advancing so very quickly. Uh, the new hospital will be of the the kind of design that's fully flexible, so that the inside of the hospital will be able to I increase or detract in line with the the type of technology we're going to be using. Yeah, that that, that kind of thing. So that's just a few examples of how these sort of big um, infrastructure projects help the so island. What, but of they course, we employment. They, they, yeah, um, but we have to we have to manage the timing of mm -hmm. them because if you if they overlap, you get overheating of the economy. If you put too much demand on, for example, construction, the the, the cost of construction um, is 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 impacted. So it's not just about doing them; it's about the timing timing them carefully to make sure we get the maximum impact and the maximum benefit. Okay, right. Thank you for that. I thought you were going to let me just talk about electoral reform, and there's only one thing that worries me, well, and that is the loss. The economy, that is the loss of the senator in the states next week, without the permission or the knowledge or the consent of the public. We stand. Uh, we stand. Um, we're going to be asked to remove the most democratic office uh, in, in, that we elect, and that is the office of senator. I'll come in on that as well. Um, I'll, I'll Which must not be allowed. Right. Right. Yeah. I can come in on a couple of John's clients. So, electoral reform. Um, yeah, people do need to be aware that there's a huge amount of debates next week. You may want to consider whether it's the right thing to be debating in the middle of a pandemic, but there you go. Um, and um, as Lyndon has said, uh, there is the risk that you could end up, or the possibility or probability or desire, depending on your viewpoint, to A, lose the centres completely, uh, B, lose the constables completely, C, um, depends on your viewpoint, and there'll be different views along this uh, panel, by the way, um, the switch to super constituencies versus keeping people uh, electing in their parishes, what that does to community and culture, you may want to consider. Uh, that hasn't had too much publicity publicly, I would have said, mm -hmm. and so people might want to consider what they think or and or whether there should be a referendum on that or not, whatever the proposals are that come through. Um, uh, but also people might want to consider, do they consider electoral reform to be their, uh, their priority at the moment? Um, just to go back down to some of the other bits and pieces, you mentioned IT systems. I won't dwell on that too much. We are investing a lot into our IT infrastructure. Um, as we've said, some of our systems are, are very, very old. Uh, they are clunky. They may or may not talk to each other. You don't get that kind of smooth integration uh, uh, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and the one I used last night, but for those who weren't watching, I think it was last night, um, was that I think when I started in 2005, I was certainly unaware that our main underlying financial system, uh, if you like the accounting system, uh, I think hadn't been... 
um, maintained or upgraded, something along those lines, since about 2005. It's that old. Uh, so it is kind of, hang let's take the principle there, it ba basically it is that old. And um, and that's why we are putting that we are putting tens of millions of pounds into IT, uh, exactly. But again, and that's also about you think about how we've changed in the last six months, let alone over the last 15 years. Um, states properties, you won't get any arguments about me from me on the whole on everything we should be doing on states properties. Again, part of the reluctance has been about people. You know, it's not a sexy subject. Why would you want to put money into states officers or whatever it is? But there comes a point. I saw. I just. I'll do a story. Afraid. Very very quickly. Um, many many years ago, I had to go into oncology for a, or endoscopy, as it were, for um, a, 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 anyway a procedure. Yeah, we'll leave it there. And um, yes, we will get that, that, that treatment from time to time. And uh, at that point, uh, they said, well, "What do you do? Your occupation?" I always used to put accountant down because I thought politician at that point not a good move. Yeah. And then I thought well, I better do it. And then they said um, uh, treasury or property. Well, I, I thought I was going to start putting treasury. And I think it was when we were putting tax and GST was coming in. Not a good move. I put property down. Oh, you're responsible for the hospital. No, <laughs> you know. but they took me in, and the way they'd repaired a leak in that room, there was a, a long sandy leak over a five grand photocopier, there's a tarpaulin to catch the drips, and a tube to take that water out the window, and that's how they'd maintained it for a number of months, and that was the approach to maintenance, and that was appalling. Well, well, Going down to, um, finally... If, I'm, go on. if yep. I may interject, Chief Minister, because uh, we know that the case for a new hospital has been well made, yep. um, and um, we do now have more than 70 questions that have come in this evening, Good. so Let's we go. need to fire through these, and I know we've still got a member of the audience to go through. Senator uh, Gorst, one for you here. Now, I know this is a complex subject. Has the new UK Fisheries Bill marked the end of the Bay of Gromville Treaty? Uh, no, a short answer. Brilliant. Uh, Next but, question. But uh, <laughs> the negotiations and what the European Union is asking in regard to border checks yep. means that the Bay of Gromville Agreement, as it currently is, uh, will not uh, be fair to Jersey fishermen. And so we will see what uh, the result of the uh, negotiation is, but it's not connected with the PEC. Now, this is, uh, just touching on this, this is a tough stance that you're taking, uh, that you're fronting at the moment uh, to the UK. Um, it's not something I recall in, in my years covering stories um, here in the island, the, the, a politician here standing up to the UK. I mean, how do you, how do you uh, feel about doing that on a personal level? And, and are you worried that you know, there is that, that risk of it affecting other aspects of Brexit negotiations and deals and international reputations that you are obviously responsible for? Uh, no, I've been quite clear with ministers, as have other ministers, uh, that we disagree with them on this particular issue, but we've got very good relationships with a lot of ministers uh, right across the government. Um, let's remember, every new government comes in and has to deal with whatever it's put on its plate. When I first became chief minister, the, one of the first things we had to do was take the UK, UK government to court over its L LVCR issue. So we're, we're not unused to these challenges, but it's really important that it's, we, we limit it to the issue because at the end of the day, our most important uh, constitutional and trading relationship is with the United Kingdom. Uh, Deputy Martin, another one that's come in here, and we've, we've seen a lot of this on social media. When uh, is customer and local services going to open its doors again? You know, people are sick and fed up of not getting calls back. Not getting no, I'm, I'm sorry, that's not true. I get an update. It's The doors are not open, but if you go down there, I walk down there, a lot of the time people are on the door, like they're at the town hall I'm taking. People can have an appointment if they need to come in. Do you really want elderly? And people are saying, oh, the elderly can't get in, and you know, people who, who are sick can't get in. No, I'm protecting them. So the only thing that people were really content about through lockdown, they got their pension every time. They got their income support. It's because my officers, a month or six weeks before, split the team. Some were already working from home. We were training new people, new form quickly. So it's not shut, ring up. I ring it every other day. It's seven, um, you can do one for this too. And then you go through and do the bit you want. It's not shut, it's open. But... 
especially now with the you know COVID again, I'm protecting my staff so that people out there get their money, and that's basically as simple as that. So any islander can walk down to that office and somebody you know during normal business hours and there's someone there, but they will ask you at the door, if, like they do at the town hall, why are you here and yep. have you got an appointment? Ring up. We can and if we can deal deal with it on the phone, and if you really need someone to come out to you, we're sending people out to to, to deal right. with it. It's you know it, it's really got to be done this way at the moment. And I, I'm sorry, you know, but that's what it is. No, that's good. I'm, I'm sure people will be uh, very reassured to hear that. Now, just on the subject of pensions there in elderly, we might have been, um, or I may have been guilty of it earlier about talking about upskilling or cross-skilling, developing, investing in our youngsters. Somebody's made a very valid, a couple of people have made some valid points here about investing in the elderly, retraining them. Obviously, retirement age is, is going to keep going. People need to be working for longer. Some of those jobs that they might have done aren't going to be there if we move into this new digital robotic age. What about what about Absolutely. investing in those? I look, we passed the, the age discrimination. You don't have to retire for any job. But a lot of people of my age started school at 15 and 16. They've had enough at 65, 67, which is around now. The uh, you know we, we'll have to look at it. And it, again, as I said earlier. The youngsters are paying for those people's pensions. And actually, it is sort of if it was that easy to make the population smaller and get the p working people, we've got the immigration, and this is what um, Senator Gorse is dealing with. Um, as of uh, the 1st of January, nobody from Europe can walk into Jersey without a, a, a visa. Uh, you know, th that's one uh, lot of work force that we're going to cut off. We're going to have the four months, the nine, uh, sorry, the nine months, the four years and the possible ten years. But, very, but come and work here. You can live in really not great accommodation for those four years and then buy. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I've never been quite convinced that this will actually attract when there's the rest of the Europe they can go to. Um, we can only allow um, farmers, I think, from the EU and a skill set of around 30, if they're earning 30 to 35,000, exactly the same as the UK. So I still need somebody this end to be earning money to pay for the pensions that end. And yeah, I absolutely don't have a problem, people do. But I start talking to people around 65, and they are starting to do three days a week. They might want to do it a couple of years. By around 70, they really do not want to work, the majority, but actually, absolutely, we. As I say, the age discrimination, you cannot be sacked if you can do your job and, you know, for your age and they, people should be able to take you on. And what about, retrain, what about helping retrain people to do different jobs when they reach those ages? Yeah, but then I would we, like... We've had a question here from somebody who's a bricklayer. He said, well, you know, I'm assuming yeah. it's a he, it could be a she, obviously. How am I going to lay bricks when I'm 70? I'm well, probably to wouldn't want to, uh, you know, it's it's uh, working all weathers, laying bricks after probably about 45, 50 is not great. Mm. So, yeah, absolutely want to retrain people. I want those people, as though, as uh, Lyndon has said, in the construction industry to start training the youngsters because these are the real skills that are, you know, going. Um, you know, bricks, when did you see it? You know, it's all slabs and, and mm. everything now. So, absolutely. I Look, if people want to work, they want to retrain and we're um, working... He's now a minister, but he was my assistant minister across education. And it wasn't about the youngsters. It was all about retraining and skills. And absolutely, there's money in the government plan for that. And we need to do it. OK, right. Let's invite uh, Matt, please, up to the microphone to ask your question. Um, so my name's Matt. I'm not representing anybody. Um, I work for one of the banks and I'm a resident of St Helier. Um, one question that I want to ask, but I'm just going to widen it slightly to what I was prejudging to ask. Um, what support is the government um, going to look to offer the hospitality and travel sector next year, given that we know now that the ramifications and the development with COVID, we're not going to get the numbers of tourists and travellers next year to the island. We probably won't come back to the level it was for several years to come. And I do know that you did give a loan to Blue Islands um, to help support them um, through um, the current crisis of the pandemic. So what support is the government looking to offer those sectors next year? I think, I think that's a great question because this is something as well that I've received a couple of questions about. I mean, you know, the island has worked tremendously hard um, over the years to increase its connectivity. Mm. And that is now under serious threat. You know, we've got a, a ferry company hanging on by its fingernails, not really making the profits that it needs to survive. We're re the airlines are pulling out of routes left, right and centre. 
are we ever going to see those back? You know, we are vulnerable as an island. So, um, you're right. I mean, part of the hardest hit sector of our economy has been hospitality and the hotel accommodation um, and sector. And, and that's actually why the Treasury Minister announced the new hotel accommodation support scheme, which is opened for applications on Monday. That is aimed at providing financial support to, um, to hoteliers based on their, on their room numbers to ensure that we maintain those key assets so they're ready um, to, so they're there. I mean, the highest value for land use in Jersey currently is for housing and accommodation. So there's great temptation for hotel owners um, who are really struggling now to come out of the industry, and that's the last thing we want. We need those hotels to stay in the industry so we can uh, pick up where we left off. And there is strong demand for Jersey. First of all, we've recently announced um, a, a Jet 2 five new um, routes uh, for Jersey. We're going to be making another announcement in the not too distant future. There's strong interest in the island ports of Jersey. Visit Jersey are doing a great job. They're working closely with airlines now. There's a lot of pent up um, demand. Also, because of our, our, border, um, our border test uh, and track and tracing system, we managed to keep the island open, albeit on a much smaller scale than the previous year, which meant we were able to strengthen our our business uh, relationship with EasyJet and British Airways, and so we ha we have very good um, standing with them. So I'm, I'm I'm confident that as we come through this, Jersey will very quickly um, get back to um, where it was, not least because of that, and also we are a very very good quality holiday destination. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, just just continuing that theme, the hotel support scheme. Obviously, hotels. Mm -hmm. Those that aren't being snapped up by developers, uh, the, 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 the hotels are still open for business uh, and they're first in line to receive aid. What about the other aspects of the tourism industry that rely on visitors, attractions, services? They, uh, they haven't got access yet to this money. They probably need it more because they've well, got no customers. We, we mustn't forget we've been providing a very strong package of fiscal support right since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, uh, payroll co the co-funded co payroll scheme which continues to evolve uh, bank loan guarantee scheme deferrals of social security um, gst um, uh, and and other and other um, support that that has helped that's protected businesses and thousands of jobs right right through the summer and that that's all still in place um, with the exception of social security um, deferrals which have have, have now finished but we've just improved the payroll um, co-funded support scheme for the um, for the winter, which means it puts up maximum contribution to 60% from potentially 30% where, where it was due to go. So we have increased support there. There's still a big challenge with our events organisers, uh, tourist, tourism attractions and other businesses that are suffering serious detriment. And there are businesses that, because of the restrictions we've put in place, have not been able to trade. And we're on the verge of announcing a further scheme it, it, it is late. I had hoped it, we could announce it at the same time as a hotel accommodation scheme, but uh, officials are still working on the detail. So that is coming to help right. those businesses. But with some of these hotels and some of these businesses, we're talking about 80, 90 percent detriment levels. It's huge, the impact. Hmm. Um, so support is on the way um, for them because we must retain as many of those um, as possible. Uh, I mean, for I the mean, recovery. Look, look, looking at the arts as well, mm -hmm. I know um, Ryan mentioned that earlier. The Dean made some excellent points uh, today, yesterday, about the numbers of people allowed um, in church compared to in a restaurant. What about the numbers of people who can go safely and sit in the audience at the Opera House or the Art Centre? Is it time to start opening those back up now to help well, boost that side of the economy? Do you want to... I'll have a go. I? I mean, it's, it is one of the really difficult areas we're grappling with, and it's this whole thing about what do we do um, to avoid a lockdown. And part of that is why uh, we've been putting the measures in. We've been strengthening the comments around guidance and, and all the things about please wear masks inside, etc., etc. And that's why now, uh, as of this week, the laws have been put in place, which is what the, the Dean was commenting on, around giving... Uh, I was, that was yesterday. I was about to point at Richard Redd, who was off to my right yesterday, um, around gatherings and around masks. And uh, and it is really difficult, and it is all around. So I think uh, the health minister will take those comments on board and will go away and reconsider. 
uh, well, sorry, reevaluate and see see what the advice is. But at the moment, the numbers are still um, high-ish, shall we say? They are the measures we've got in place are suppressing the increase, but we are still showing increases, although it's flexing a little bit. It, we're kind of we're kind of at that middle point now, of um, of of seeing what the next few days bring. And of course, the measures that we brought in, you'll only will take two or three weeks to then see if they've had the right impact or not. And it is all around the responsibility of islanders and how we as a community who to date have worked really, really well, how we as islanders all, all interact. And part of that is around what's, what's sometimes referred to as mingling. And the difficulty is, so if you go into a restaurant, the view is, if it's a family group, you still tend to go in in your own little cluster. You're sitting at a table over there. You're not mingling with this group over here. And you only tend to go in there once every so often perhaps. Uh, the concern with other communities and the example used for churches, and I appreciate there are different views on this, okay, but this is the medical view, um, is that it's a different group of people, potentially at the more vulnerable area, at a more vulnerable uh, age and things like that, and potentially uh, it's the concern around do they, at the end of the service, all go out and start chatting to each other and not distancing? Now, some people are saying, well, they operate it really, really well. That also then goes back to uh, what the Arts Centre do and, and well, the Opera House has obviously been closed for a while. And it's how you manage the, ins and the ingress and egress, if you like, of those buildings. So um, at the moment, I don't think we'd shine any, any greater light or hope on that because the real uh, aim is to try and make sure that by the limited measures you've got in place, and can there be workarounds, and, and bear in mind we've got Christmas, if you go back to the church, it's very, obviously, uh, spe very incredibly important time for a whole range of faiths uh, on the island. Um, is, is there a way to, to manage that? But the fundamental focus, and it's been really difficult all the way through, uh, as I said, um, uh, you know, uh, I remember Friday the 13th of March, which was when uh, Dr. Muscat came to us and said, if you do nothing, the latest modelling showing that 500 people could die. Or we've had the ethical framework and things we've had to put in. We've had some really difficult decisions. We've come through really, really well. Uh, and what we want to make sure is we, the aim is to try and to not to lose control uh, at that kind of le next challenge. And winter's going to be tough. But if people... Um, and the trouble is you're dealing, sorry, I'm talking a bit too long, but you're dealing yep. with the kind of 10% or the 20% of people who don't follow the guidelines, who go away and have the parties or whatever, and or drink too much alcohol, and then, of course, get quite, you know, as you do, less inhib inhibitions, mix more, yep. and that creates a spread. So well, that's I mean, the dilemma we're having. I understand that. I mean, we, we've got the um, responding to COVID-19 um, discussion and debate on... Yep. Friday night, so we can certainly touch on that. Um, and then tomorrow is rebalancing our finances, but I'll come on to that um, shortly. But change, change the subject completely. Um, Senator Gorst, somebody here is... Uh, I'm not picking on you for any particular reason here, but somebody has accused the government of it pretending to listen. It, it consults... It says it's consulting, but it's not consulting. You've you've been in the in the um, chief minister's uh, seat for a number of years, and now you're doing an important job overseas. Does the does the government listen? Does it care what the people think in Jersey? Every government is accused of uh, not listening. Um, I, I think that uh, governments try to listen, uh, but sometimes the issues. Uh, that it's uh, asking about are very complicated uh, and there are difficult decisions made and sometimes we don't always communicate well why we've arrived at a uh, decision and that can lead to people thinking that we're not really listening but actually uh, listening to islanders, understanding what their concerns are and responding to them is a fundamental tenet of democracy. Okay. I mean, the um, just I mean, listening to people as well. They've they've some there have been some critics, but there've been lots of fans of, for instance, uh, some of the schemes like the spend local, uh, the spend local card. Um, and I know now we've got governments from overseas interested in those as well. Is that something that we we might do again? Is is there a need to do it again? Um, 
if I'll pick that one up, should I? But um, I think the Spend Local one is something I think we should all be very proud of, um, and so I'm very pleased. It was uh, a whole range of us sort of were, um, were all involved with it, and I was um, quite clear in my view that I, I preferred that over other options that were uh, available. Um, and essentially, that's why we've asked Islanders to keep the cards, uh, that once we've evaluated the data and seen how, how it's been, the anecdotal evidence is good, but we want to get back to the data. I think we're expecting to, uh, it's been worked on at the moment, so hopefully we'll get a lot more feedback before Christmas. Uh, but my take, to be honest, would be kind of sometime January, February time, if you were going to do something, that might be the time you might do it. But it's very much of, let's see what the data says, the anecdotal evidence is good, and it's uh, the I think the indications are that footfall increased, for example, and therefore got people back into town. Um, see where we are, where we are going through winter, and at what point do, do you need to do that boost? And for me, if we did, that would be a perfectly logical and fairly efficient way of getting some and money back. And have we got the money to do it again? Yeah, uh, well, that's the whole point. Um, but in terms of we have got contingency in the government plan for extra COVID measures, we've got. Um, all sorts of, I'm sure there are various pots of money one could access if we needed to do it from a, uh, a stimulus point of view, an economic recovery point of view. But we've got to make sure it is effective. You might, uh, and I emphasise might, want to consider actually there's a particular sector you want to target rather than the broad-based approach that we had, we did okay. last time around. Senator Gorse, do you itch into coming? I'm sure if my uh, other boss was here, the Treasury Minister, uh, she would be saying that uh, if we are going to do that, and I think it did stimulate the economy and it, w it was very helpful uh, at that point in time. Uh, then, of course, we've just agreed a 50 million stimulus pot. So some of that could be used for it if we, uh, having looked at the evidence, can show that there was evidence for uh, that stimulus. And that actually might be a better use of some of that money than small capital projects because of the overheating issue. And, and this is this emergency pot of money that people can apply for. They can make a, a decent case. and. What sort of things would you like to see it spent on? Well, I think that we, uh, if we look at, as Lyndon said in his opening uh, comments on the on the video, if we look at the uh, success of other uh, fiscal stimulus that governments undertaken, or we can look back to the uh, financial crisis, uh, those fiscal stimulus uh, monies were spread out from small capital projects, some done by departments, some done by third sector organisations. I expect to see all of that. But I do think it's also important to think about uh, issues of training, uh, reskilling, cross-skilling, whatever we want to talk about, thinking about um, productivity in businesses as well, or perhaps supporting with technology solutions. Um, We've got to be really careful that we don't just focus on capital development projects, but we think about a wide range. And we want to be led, actually, by third and voluntary sector, uh, as well as arm's length organisations. We in government don't have all of the answers to these issues, and that's why uh, we are opening it up so that people can approach us with projects that it's important that they're timely uh, and targeted. And what's the third T? Maybe Senator Temporary. Temporary. Yeah, yeah. so you, you're not increasing the bottom line yeah. money. I think for me it's also about, um, I wouldn't mind on a, on a small percentage, something that's a little bit outside, you know, out of the box, to, uh, sort of outside normal thinking. And I don't know, you know, Ian talked about um, productivity and things like that. Is there some, some real specific robotic solution? I don't know what mm -hmm. it is, but to say, actually, yeah, we're going to apply that we're going to try it in that particular area, and if that works, you can then roll it out in a, in a different way. But actually, to take a little, uh, 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 and uh, I'm talking at a small level, otherwise um, uh, Susie will come and um, uh, have some very strong words with me. But, um, uh, but you know, to take a, a small element of risk and just say, actually, if we did th do that and it worked, then there might be something you can roll out over the, over the whole productivity yeah. angle or population angle, which we know we've got issues with. And Deputy Chief Minister? Just very quickly, I think the, the fiscal stimulus, the 50 million, the idea is to get that into the economy next year. But I would like to see it spent on projects that keep giving. That once they're built, they keep making an economic contribution into the future. But isn't there a requirement that the, the project has to end by the end of 2021? Yes. Finished by. Right. Well, you know, so, you know, it's got to be, it's not something that you're going to be building in five years' time if it's a capital project. Right. It's got to be, be up and running. Yeah. Right. But, but temporary means 
it's a temporary spend. So you've you've got an end and a start for the spend. You're yeah. not you're not uh, increasing. It doesn't get written into this exactly. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. increase yeah. bottom line expenditure. Yeah. Okay. And you know, fine if it, if you had to cut the things that actually didn't quite get finished, but you've actually started it halfway through the year. It takes slightly longer, but you know you've, the the benefits are such. Then fine. I think the point is you've got to be flexible around it. You're looking to spend the 50 million, and it's about benefit to the island, but predominantly around fiscal stimulus. Okay, right, we've got one minute left, so we'll have a quick yes or no to this one. It's, <laughs> a, it's an old favourite. <laughs> the Battle of Flowers. Here's one way of making money from it. Move it to a Friday or a Saturday, turn it into uh. a big weekend festival <laughs> that'll generate lots of money. Would you be in favour of that? Let's go start with you. Yes or no, Chief Minister? Um, I quite like the... Uh, I knew I, he couldn't give a yes or sorry, no. Come on, come on, um, yes or no. I was going, I quite, sorry, I quite like the, the, thurs, the Thursday afternoon and the night parade. You've got to bear in mind the people who take part, okay. because it's, it's physically exhausting. I've done that quite a number of years, yeah, yeah. huge support That's of it, fine. as you know. Uh, but it put it away. If the organisers turn around and says, yes, we want to try it, and it works, You'd be up great. for it. Senator yep. Farnham? Yes. Senator Gorst? Uh, it's already on a Friday night. It's a fantastic yes. moonlight parade. Yeah. Um, so if you can make it on Friday and Saturday, I'm all up for that. And Deputy Matt? Yeah, it covers the weekend because all the people have worked all the way up to it. Uh, they have prize givings and everything on the Saturday and people are over for the weekend. Thursday is the parade, Friday night, moonlight, fantastic, which we didn't do, but we are doing for years. And then it's the weekend. Most people come for that week. Great. So I think it's brilliant anyway. Great stuff. Right, well, thank you for that. Thank you, panel members. Thank you, audience. Thank you as well to you at home who have sent your questions. Uh, apologies if we didn't get round to yours. There are still two more sessions. A lot of these questions can apply uh, to the others as well. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Gary Burgess will be back in this seat, all being well, and he's going to have with him uh, the Chief Minister again for his fourth night. Uh, he'll be joined by the Minister for Treasury and Resources, uh, Deputy Susie Pinnell, and, of course, the Minister for External Relations, uh, Senator Gorst, I believe, could be back as well. Well, he will be now, I've said it. Um, and they'll be talking about rebalancing our finances. So how are we going to balance the books? How is Jersey going to cope with spending all of this money on one hand? Where are we going to find it from on the other? Keep your questions coming in overnight and over the weekend through Slido, the same hashtag on the email. And also, if you want to be here tomorrow to ask questions, email in govplan2021 at gov.je or call the number 440 800. That's all from us. Thanks for joining us. Good night.